Hello everyone, uh, good evening. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Shahar Khan. It's a pleasure to welcome you all uh, to another Facebook Live uh, in regards to breast implant illness. And uh, a very important uh, hot topic is, uh, is gaining momentum and awareness uh, across the medical community. The purpose here today is to discuss and to answer the many questions you have so that I, as a board certified uh, plastic surgeon, can discuss and uh, share with you my knowledge in regards to um, what is breast implant illness. So a little bit briefly about myself, I'm a board certified plastic surgeon. Um, I, before that, after completion of medical school, I did become a board certified general surgeon during which I trained uh, to do mastectomies and also trauma along with the many aspects and facets of surgery, including thoracic surgery amongst the many um, other uh, subsets of uh, general surgery, including burns. Following that, I did two years of burn uh, reconstruction. Uh, I did get a burn fellowship as well in burns and critical care. And then following that, I did three years uh, of plastic surgery training uh, in order to get board certified by the one and only board that certifies and authenticates plastic surgeons. This is the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. My practice is exclusively now devoted to what is removal of saline implants, silicone implants, and also residual capsules. And for a practice when I started, I did all aspects uh, of reconstruction uh, except for augmentation. I've only done one augmentation in my career in order to get board certified, uh, and that was on a uh, cancer patient. So having said this, um, I will go ahead and get started. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Please share this with others. There are millions of patients who have implants who are suffering and hurting and who have not even heard of what is breast implant illness. Um, and I hope to answer the many questions uh, that you may have. So a little bit briefly, I have a lot of patients that come to me from out of state, almost two thirds of which uh, come to me uh, from out of state, they travel. Uh, and this is where, this is a very well tolerated outpatient surgery. Just within this past year, I've been privileged to have patients from Italy, from England, from New Zealand. I have a patient coming in the next couple of weeks from New Delhi, India. I have a patient from Iran and also uh, a patient from Germany. And amongst the many other states that uh, basically the patients come to me for what is um, explantation. Now, the very important concept here is that what is breast implant illness? Breast implant illness is a constellation of signs and symptoms of the many symptoms that are known as silicon toxicity where the patients report from head down the hair loss to basically migraine headaches, rashes, you have dryness of the eyes, you have throat trickle, um, you have uh, vertigo, tinnitus ringing in the ears, um, you have thyroid endocrine issues, you have patients with fibromyalgia, upper neck back symptoms. The hallmark features of breast implant illness are the many rheumatological joint problems that the patients present with difficulty breathing, uh, shortness of breath, chest pain, palpitations, heart irregularities, tingling numbness in the arms and legs, uh, GI issues, gastrointestinal issues, sensitivity to foods. Uh, you have patients with uh, reproductive uh, issues as well, um, and patients that complain of the many connective tissue disorders uh, uh, that mimic uh, what is a breast implant illness. <clears throat> Now, the overall, this is where when the patients come to me, I go over the entire history and physical uh, as far as what has been worked up by their doctors, um, if they have any history of medical illnesses, for example, if they have any uh, ailments such as hypothyroidism, uh, where if their thyroid has been corrected. Unfortunately, today I talk or a patient uh, contacted me. She just got diagnosed or recently with Logaric's disease, ALS. Um, you know, and so there are very sick patients uh, from patients who have rheumatoid arthritis to patients, young moms, for example, who have uh, no medical issues. So I myself go through and talk to them. And this is essentially a diagnosis of exclusion. There is no lab test. There is no 
a specific lab uh, that will diagnose breast implant illness. Also, there are <clears throat> no imaging modalities like MRI that will say that the patient has uh, breast implant illness. Now, one will ask and question, you know, is this even a real entity? And there is no other better way to look at it than if you look at the manufacturers themselves. So I have a journal, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons a journal, and on the back is the mentor ad, if you will. This is the mentor advertisement, as you can see, in natural field, they're advertising. And then if you look at the fine print, and I'm going to go ahead and read, this is where uh, this is uh, becomes critical to understand what the manufacturers, what mentor is saying. And you can certainly go to my Facebook page um, and look this up or read and specifically look for it. I'll take some pictures of it and we'll post as well. So it says over here, warning, breast implants are not considered lifetime devices, period. The longer people have them, the greater the chances are that they will develop complications, some of which will, re will require more surgery. Now, as you can see, implants are notorious for contracture. 8, 10, 13 percent of the time, contract, capsular contracture occurs. You also know of infection. You also know of the malposition. Also, the self monthly breast exam is altered when the patients are screening for the self monthly breast exam to look for breast cancer. The mammograms are not being done by the ladies simply because they feel hurt. Uh, there are many patients who complain of numbness, tingling in the nipple areola complex, also pain, acute and chronic pain. And remember, there is this concept of silent rupture that we're going to read. And again, I'm just continuing to read over here, um, you know, in regards to the implants, um, implants that have been banned uh, from 1992 to 2007. Also, breast imp and quote, quote, uh, breast implants have been associated with the development of a cancer of the immune system called breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. B-I-A-A-L-C-L, period. This cancer occurs more commonly in patients with textured breast implants than smooth implants, comma, although rates are not well defined. Some patients have died from B-I-A-L-C-L. And as you can imagine, this was a few years ago, the FDA <coughs> highlighted the association of textured implants. Now, what's important to read here is, and again, this is directly verbatim from the warning, uh, that uh, is highlighted here. It says warning, uh, as you can see, warning. And it says, uh, large cell lymphoma, this cancer occurs, quote, this cancer occurs more commonly in patients with textured breast implants than smooth. So smooth cell, uh, smooth implants are also associated, but to a lesser extent. So that is important to note. And then lastly, this is also the third point highlighted in this box right here, the third point, and I'm going to read, Quote, patients receiving breast implants have reported a variety of systemic symptoms such as joint pain, muscle aches, confusion, chronic fatigue, autoimmune diseases, and others, period. Individual patient risk for developing these symptoms has not been well established, period. Some patients report complete resolution of symptoms when the implants are removed without replacement, period. So this tells you that breast implant illness does exist. That's what the symptoms are highlighted and that there is resolution. Now the whole goal and gist of the surgery is what? To remove the entire implant, capsule, and all inflamed tissue completely, definitively, sincerely. This is the capsule plus the inflamed tissue in the periphery. And to remove it completely off of the rib in the vast majority of the cases where the implant is sitting directly on top of the rib. To remove the periosteum, perichondrium of the rib, along with the fascia of the intercostal, along with the fascia of the pectoralis minor muscle. And then underneath the fascia of the pectoralis major at the inferior portion, such that complete total capsule removal is done. This is essentially the gist and heart of the surgery. For a plastic surgeon to basically have a very healthy explant practice, there is two commitments. There are two commitments that the plastic surgeon must definitively have. Number one, the surgeon must believe in breast implant illness. If the surgeon does not believe in breast implant illness, how can you do an operation that you don't believe in? So the surgeon has to 
number one, verbally outright state that breast implant illness exists. In the world that we live in today, many plastic surgeons don't want to even hear the word breast implant illness. They don't want to even utter the word breast implant illness. And there are surgeons that have operated on some of my patients and they uh, refuse to write down breast implant illness on the piece of paper. Yes, it does not have an ICD-10 code, but that term exists, right? This is uh, essentially, what is this breast implant illness? Patients receiving breast implants have reported a variety of systemic symptoms, such as joint pain, muscle aches, confusion, chronic fatigue, autoimmune diseases, and others. So this is breast implant illness by definition. The manufacturers are acknowledging that, and the FDA has acknowledged that. Uh, and they tell you to go ahead and get help if you have these problems. Now, going back to the point, the surgeon has to accept and agree that breast implant illness does exist. So this patient went and got operated on by a surgeon who does not, who did not want to write and acknowledge that breast implant illness exists. How can you expect the surgeon to basically uh, do the right surgery? And by definition, if a surgeon is augmenting, they truly do not believe in breast implant illness. Otherwise, why would you deliberately purposefully put in implants that you know will ultimately only hurt the patient? So if a surgeon is not putting in implants that authenticates, validates, and certifies that that surgeon truly is a believer in breast implant illness. And for a board certified plastic surgeon to not augment that automatically means that they're financially uh, not going to be performing as much because it takes almost an hour or less, 45 minutes to an hour to put in an implant, whereas it takes me on average four hours to remove a implant uh, plus minus and the point here is, it is a financial sacrifice for the explant surgeon to not put in implants. And that authenticates, validates the plastic surgeon. Now, the other 50% is where now the surgeon has once accepted the fact that the breast implant illness exists and he's no longer augmenting. Now, the second half is the surgeon is able to do the surgery and is able to physically uh, carry out the operation, which is a very tedious, meticulous operation in that avascular plane such that, as you know, that the entire capsule is removed. And this is confirmed by the many patients who followed the surgeon on social media, preferably, or the surgeon has a track record of doing the surgeries where he's posting videos of the chest while showing complete removal of the capsule. Because remember, that's the whole surgery. Not 80% of the time, not 90% are not depending. No, all the time. And this is where the surgeon has the track record. Now, I will tell you, there are patients <clears throat> that my own patients have gone elsewhere and gotten a lift. My own patients have gotten, and for example, some other intervention that this is the time where the other surgeon validates and confirms and authenticates what I said in my operative note. So this is also very important that the surgeon is able to do the surgery and there is a reaffirmation by the many other patients that the surgery was done in the manner it was. Now, one of the best and the first many ways to do is that your bond with the surgeon must be very direct and defined, meaning you yourself should be talking to the surgeon, not talking to the front desk lady or the PA or the nurse practitioner or the physician assistant or the medical student or the resident or the fellow. You are supposed to be talking directly to the surgeon because he's the only one who's doing the surgery and that you are directly getting that feedback from him or her. The surgeon must dedicate the time to you and confirm with you verbally and attest on that document, which is that consent form, which is a medical legal bind that says that 100% total capsulectomy is going to be performed in end block fashion, preferably, or 100% total capsulectomy, and that there is no partial capsulectomy, that the capsule must be physically removed directly off of the rib in the manner that I described earlier, where the fascia of the intercostal muscle, fascia of the uh, pectoralis minor, perichondrium, periosteum, and the fascia of the serratus anterior is removed along with the fascia of the pectoralis major and the inferior aspect along with the capsule and implant and all inflamed tissue. And then once removed, this is then tested to rule out the BILCL, to rule out malignancy, breast cancer, squamous cell cancer. That was another highlight by the FDA a couple of years ago. So all of that is ruled out. And this is where the patient feels 
comfortable and has the peace of mind that the surgeon did what was outlined by the surgeon in pre-op. Now, I will tell you, I'm very busy. And believe it or not, on average, I do only six of these operations in a week. Some of my friends do six augmentations in a day. So you can imagine how fast an augmentation is compared to removal. And I myself is very, I'm very much involved. I'm indulged with my patients. So all my patients, as you will see, know me and I know them because every patient is a challenge. Every patient has a real history of what is their past medical history, how the implants have affected them, and a process of that questionnaire. So that questionnaire is that key where I can talk to a patient, be it California or Texas, anywhere, and I can gauge the intensity of how in, in, in how involved the breast implant illness is. Some patients check off 40 uh, out of the 55 symptoms, the many organ systems that are affected that I mentioned highlighted earlier. Some patients only five. So this is where if, you know, the first line that I read that breast implants are not meant to be in the body forever. So the, the, the this is where you have to have that specific bond and you have to have that confidence such that if your surgery is done today, you put your head on the pillow and you have that smile and peace of mind that your surgeon did the right surgery and your surgeon is content with the surgery and your surgeon removed all of the capsule. It is inadequate, improper, and wrong for the surgeon to cauterize and say, I removed the whole capsule. Or wrong for the surgeon to say the capsule was so thin and I left it behind. It is wrong for the surgeon to say it is the capsule is going to get dissolved by the body wrong. Believe it or not, just within the last one month, I heard a patient that said that she had an MRI done in 2017 and her surgeon said it's okay to have a ruptured implant in you and that it is fine. The body in itself will equilibrate, normalize and wall this uh, ruptured implant. And so in all these years, she's had a ruptured implant. There's another patient that came to me and she had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis diagnosed at age four. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis diagnosed and she got implants uh, in later on in her, I believe, third decade, which is wrong. So according to the guidelines from the manufacturers, any patient who is immunocompromised, such as diabetic, um, uh, a patient who is a transplant, kidney transplant recipient, or a patient who has juvenile rheumatoid arthritis should not and cannot and must not get these implants because of the contraindication, the risks that are associated with patients who are immunocompromised, as clearly highlighted by the manufacturers who make the implants, who are telling us exactly what to, uh, who, who are the patients to avoid putting in implants. Now, the other thing I want to mention here is, so one of the questions that I got asked earlier uh, one of the questions I got, how uh, do I know that your surgeon got the entire uh, capsule uh, and the implant out? The question uh, can be answered in five ways. Number one, that your surgeon made a nice generous incision in order to remove that implant. So if your surgeon has made only a two centimeter incision to remove a 500 cc implant, you know you cannot have done that. Uh, total capsulectomy or the end block or another patient that came to me and said my surgeon went through the nipple areola and went straight down and removed the whole capsule that physically is impossible to dissect off of the rib uh, so the, the to the diameter of the implant essentially dictates the length of the incision and I only make a horizontal incision right in the crease such that the incision hides in the crease I do not go in an up and down from the uh, nipple areola all the way down because number one, I don't want to put a scar in the center of the chest. I saw a patient earlier on in this week who had surgery done by another surgeon who put an incision right around the nipple areola in a young lady and went with this incision that went up and down. And number one, had she come to me, I would never have done a lift on her because her skin was going to recoil. She had what was a very prominent scar and she had what was a violation of the inframemory crease ligament. 
Um, and so the bottom line here is I do not want a scar right in the center of the chest where you do a self monthly breast exam and now you have an altered exam or you feel irregularities or fat necrosis and that was essentially scar tissue or could potentially be breast cancer or it may potentially complicate the reading of a mammogram simply because there was a lot of scar tissue in and around where the wound healed. Um, so going back to the five criteria that I say that kind of authenticate that a true explant was done. Number one, the length of the incision dictates the length, um, the diameter of the implant dictates the length of the incision. Uh, so a large implant means a large uh, incision. Number two, the length of the surgery. I had another patient I uh, had a, a supposed explant in an hour and a half, impossible. Otherwise, I would love to do five, six of these in a day. So on average, I take four hours uh, to do a cosmetic uh, explant where the patient had one set of implants under the muscle, for example, four hours plus minus. Number three, I give return the implants to the patient so that the, if the patient had saline implants, we, the patient knows that they were not ruptured, which... In today's world and age, a lot of patients go to surgeons where they put a needle in and pull the fluid out. And then two weeks later, they pull the rest of the implant out uh, such that it is a small incision through a deflated breast tissue, which is absolutely wrong. So the entire implant must be removed along with the capsule as one system uh, in what is the end block method or the total capsulectomy. And the implant must be returned to the patient. That is another way to confirm that it was done right. Number four, the high definition pictures and videos of the chest while showing complete removal because this is the ultimate uh, test. A patient came to me and said, well, there is question of, uh, uh, you know, there is a capsule or not. I said, just look at the videos and the pictures that in itself speaks for what and how the surgery was done, period. And number five, and that is the whole surgery in itself. And so I see a lot of pictures over uh, the several months where the surgeon just puts in two implants on the table. The surgeon has to write down the initials of the patient. So there is no HIPAA violation. The date of the surgery, 4-24-24, and the patient's initials and the surgeon's name so that we know it was that day. And the surgeon has to cut open with a high definition video the implant and the capsule and remove the implant from that to show that the entire implant underneath and around and above was completely done in the manner that it was and that pictures were also done not only of the cutting open of the capsule and implant but also of the chest walls high definition pictures and videos showing that the entire capsule was indeed very much removed and last but not least Every surgeon, just like every restaurant, every lawyer, uh, every Uber driver, every person has a internet slash Facebook, Instagram validation where the, sur the patients are talking about the surgeons and the surgeon is validated on a daily basis and an hourly basis as to his reputation, his ability to perform, his ability to follow up. And you have to see and read the operative notes, for example, in order to confirm from that medical legal document. I saw an operative note from another prominent explant surgeon and there was no mention of total capsulectomy, which is very bizarre because that's the whole essence of the surgery. Anyone can remove implants, but the surgeon must write, I performed a total capsulectomy. I performed the end block total capsulectomy and removed the entire implant and capsule as one system, leaving behind no capsule. This is where the 100-100-0 rule comes in. 100% of the time, 100% of the capsule is removed with 0% of the capsule remaining behind because this is the gist and heart of the surgery. Now, there are many... So this was another question that was asked. How can you remove all of it? There was another plastic surgeon from France who questioned if I uh, removed the whole capsule. And I said, just look at any of my videos and my uh, pictures. And I, this is the whole surgery. That is the definition. That is the proof in the pudding that I removed the whole capsule because that's the whole surgery. So a surgeon must believe in his or her mind that if any of the capsule is left behind, the disease is left behind and the patient will continue to hurt and patient will continue to suffer from the symptoms of breast implant illness. Maybe she might be improved 50, 70%, but that 20, 30, 40% will certainly linger on. 
Now, from my practice, vast majority of the patients, well over 90%, seek improvement in their many symptoms of breast implant illness. From my practice, anecdotally, that means there is no frank research that has been done. There are patients that have come to me where they had an MRI done and it showed lymph nodes that were laden with silicon or they had a rupture. They had implants for the last 20, 30, 40 years. As you can see, we know this definitively in the many biopsies that have been done that the patients had within their lung tissue silicon deposits from the silicon that leached from the implants. We know from the patients that donated their body to science after they died and the histology uh, and the microbiology and the slides show that there is electron microscopy proof and uh, uh, x-ray analysis uh, um, that shows that there was silica deposited within uh, spleen, for example, or tissues of the body. And this is where we know that despite removing the implant and capsule, that the disease lingers on simply because the patients had a rupture or they had. Now, some patients recover dramatically. It's amazing to see it within hours. Some patients right in the recovery room, some patients three months later. Remember, there, it is a process where a patient reaches that breast implant illness threshold where they start becoming sick. So a patient came to me and she said, I had a wonderful 10 years. Now all of a sudden my symptoms started to progress and now I'm highlighting almost two thirds of the symptoms of that questionnaire. Another patient, as you did, as I did a Facebook live with her, within just the first few weeks, she had the many symptoms of breast implant illness. Another lady that I took care of from Atlanta area just recently, uh, almost uh, seven, uh, six weeks ago, she had history of breast cancer and she was in grade four contracture, a lot of pain and lo and behold, she had chronic inflammation along with fat necrosis and she had surgery done just last August of 2023. So there are patients that have a period of time, but as you see, what is, what is the, 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 the very carefully written language? Breast implants are not considered lifetime devices, period. The longer people have them, the greater the chances are that they will develop complications, uh, comma, some of which will require more surgery. So the point here is that implants, you know, it's like you, you're you playing, um, you know, this Russian roulette. You might rupture soon, it might rupture later, but eventually there will come a time and the longer you have them, the higher the chance for complications. So the point here is, and again, and by no means am I trying to I use the word scare. There was another surgeon from Australia um, who basically said that I use the scare tactic. I'm not using the scare tactic. I'm just I'm just reading these instructions and these warning signs. This is like you you get a car and you have to read the instructions as to you know you cannot go above. You cannot uh, how often you have to do what. You have to read the risks of the, the, the weather conditions, let's say, if someone's about to uh, like uh, undertake a project or something before you sign up for something. And this is called medical consent for that surgeon from Australia. So I'm gonna go ahead and read some more uh, guidelines, again, from the manufacturer, so that you know if you sign up for something, this is not like, uh, like one in a million chance. Uh, this is certainly uh, real life patients and they're telling you exactly what and how uh, the risks are. So the, and I'm going to continue to read, uh, the mentor collection breast implants are indicated for breast augmentation in women who are at least 22 years old for mentor, um, and for the at least 18 years old for patients with saline implants. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and read, safety and effectiveness have not, uh, quote, safety and effectiveness have not being established in patients with autoimmune diseases, for example, lupus and scleroderma, comma, a weakened immune system, comma, conditions that interfere with wound healing and blood clotting, comma, or reduced blood supply to breast tissue, period. Patients with a diagnosis of depression, comma, or other mental health disorders should wait until resolution or stabilization of these conditions prior to undergoing breast implantation surgery. 
So I must mention there is a patient several years ago who called another Facebook owner who called me Friday 5 p.m. and said the patient's going to commit suicide if she doesn't get her surgery because she is just so depressed and she uh, has these suicidal ideations. And unfortunately, this is, we have heard this many times, depression, anxiety. And you can imagine, you know, you don't want to be non-depressed in the summertime and then get implants, meaning th this is a real problem that, uh, you know, so it is, they're like indirectly telling you that psychological issues uh, are also affected. So if someone has depression, do not get implants. How about if the depression is cyclic in nature? Uh, is that okay to get? And then you deal with depression later on. So the answer is no. Uh, and then it says over here, and again, I'm continuing to read, quote, these are risks associated with breast implant surgery. You should be aware that breast implants are not lifetime devices and the breast implantation may not be a one-time surgery, close quotes. So this is, again, look, they start off the paragraph here, warning, breast implants are not considered lifetime devices. And then they write down again in the second column right here, uh, in the second column right here, Quote, there are risks associated with breast implant surgery, period. You should be aware that breast implants are not lifetime devices and breast implantation may not be a one-time surgery, period. You may need additional unplanned surgeries on your breast because of complications or unacceptable cosmetic outcomes, period. Many of these changes to your breast falling implantation are irreversible, cannot be undone, close quotes, and breast, uh, close parentheses, and breast implants may affect your ability to breastfeed either by reducing or eliminating milk production. Breast implants are not lifetime devices. So guess what? For a third time in these two columns, for a third time they're writing this, uh, they're not lifetime devices. Breast implants are not lifetime devices and breast implantation may not be a one-time surgery. The most common complications for breast augmentation with memory gel implants include any reoperation, capsular contracture, nipple sensation changes, and implant removal with or without replacement. The most common complications with memory shaped gel implants for breast augmentation include reoperation for any reason, comma, implant removal with or without replacement, and ptosis, which is drooping of the breast. A lower risk of complication is rupture, period. The health consequences of a ruptured silicone gel implant uh, have not been fully established, period. MRI screenings are recommended three years after initial implant surgery and then every two years after to detect silent rupture, period. Breast implants are associated with the risk of breast implant-associated anaplastic larsa lymphoma, an uncommon type of lymphoma. So the bottom line here is this, look, they're telling you all these risks. And I'll tell you, anyone who has read this and who has a full understanding of what breast implants entail, I will tell you they are not worth it as the as we discussed. Now I'm going to go ahead and mention uh, some of these uh, questions, answer some of them. Uh, I see Tracy Gary is on. I connected Tracy Gary with this other nice, wonderful lady uh, from Alabama. So hopefully you are able to get the questions answered. And again, my job here is I ask the patient's permission this is a network of the many ladies who talk to each other and who learn from another and who educate one another. And the purpose today here is to raise awareness, to get your questions answered and to have 100% mutual respect for one another so that there is no, um, uh, there's complete professionalism for all of us and for the many doctors so that we educate and learn from an experience like this. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, read some of the questions. So the question becomes this, um, uh, why does the FDA not stop? I will tell you the FDA is a very passive slash unorganized group uh, of committee members. Uh, if you ask me, uh, they were delayed in the last implant ban in 1992. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, they are at a very slow pace in, for, in regards to recognizing. Now, I did call Dr. Corneliuson, uh, an MD, PhD, OBGYN doc, who is the right hand of uh, Dr. Bashar, who is a general surgeon. And 
I raised the awareness when the squamous cell cancer uh, uh, warning was brought up and the cases uh, that were associated directly with breast implants and the FDA's warning of breast implants and their association with um, uh, squamous cell cancer. I asked, uh, I said, are you not aware of the millions of ladies who are hurting from breast implant illness, the many complaints to the FDA uh, in the 350,000 or so over the years? And unfortunately, the answer was, well, we have not heard of much feedback from the patients directly in regards to the detrimental effects. You know, we have Tracy Gary here who basically was directly involved and uh, talked to the FDA uh, and certainly did raise awareness. And, you know, the FDA, I invited Dr. Cornelison to my clinic and I said, please don't listen to me, listen to my patients because they are very much hurting and I have no other interest except to help the patients. Um, so um, I am going to go ahead and um, answer. So if you look at the world of medicine, and this is true, you ask any administrator of any hospital, uh, the hospital is a money-making institution. The number one reason for bankruptcy in the United States is medical bills. Number two, the way the hospital system is work, it's incentivized to make money. That is the true purpose. At the expense of the patient, look at the high deductibles. Look at the world of uh, nar narcotics, for example, the Norcos and Vicodins that were overly prescribed. Look at the jewel cigarettes that are hurting the many teenagers who continue to smoke. Um, there, sh there was regulation that was going to fine-tune it, but unfortunately, none of it went through. And this is in the world of politics that we live in. Um, and <coughs> the point here is that unfortunately we know the right answers, but no one is very, no one has assumed that leadership role. Now I will tell you from what I see and I hear, because I talk to the ladies directly and look at the momentum of the breast implant illness. 10 years ago, no one had even heard of the word breast implant illness. Nowadays it's in the magazines and the journals and this is literally becoming an everyday talk news channels, which five years ago would refuse to even acknowledge breast implant illness because I reached them at the local ch channel news. They said we did not want to discuss uh, breast implant illness at dinner time where the families are sitting down. Now these same news channels are talking about it in every major city. I did one a couple months ago from Austin, Texas an interview. I have another one coming up from Kalamazoo where they're following my patient next Monday. Uh, one of the reporters, uh, Michigan reporters from one of the channels is going to reach me. And this is where, you know, uh, if you look at Tracy Gary and her story, she is the perfect, uh, uh, you know, warrior who can speak about she was in the news slash uh, um, uh, TV industry. And she has raised a lot of uh, awareness of the many detrimental effects of uh, breast implant illness. Now, uh, let me go ahead and uh, answer some other questions. Uh, so many of the patients ask me, you know, how is it that I'm going to travel from one part of the U.S. and come? Now, this is where I tell every patient, talk to me, talk to a local plastic surgeon, talk to two other plastic surgeons, because every time you talk to one, you're going to formulate your own opinion. Go to my Facebook page, and listen to what I have to say, and more importantly, listen to what my patients have to say, because that is the ultimate proof. Listen to what the patients have to say. Now, if you were to get a gallbladder out in San Francisco, it's exactly the same way it's going to be done in Manhattan. Minimally invasive. If you go to a hundred different plastic surgeons to get an explant, you will only be given a hundred different answers, different styles, different ways, different surgical incisions, different mentalities, different thought processes, more, more of them are going to be focused on a lift and less so on a true explant. And this is where you have to do your homework, where this is, again, the con procedure, if I may highlight. Uh, this is number one, where the implants are returned to the patient, be it saline or silicone. And this is mental psychological closure that the patient knows that these implants were removed in the manner they were. Number two, videos, high definition pictures uh, of the chest wall plus the videos of the chest wall plus on the table. 
and cutting open of the implant and capsule videos are uh, done to show that this was indeed what was done. Number three, the capsules are sent to pathology to make sure it's not the lymphoma, squamous cell cancer, breast cancer. Number four, cultures are done for aerobic, anaerobic, and fungal. Number five, this is not the time to be doing a lift. And we'll talk about that briefly. Uh, there's a very nice uh, YouTube video that Stacy, uh, that uh, uh, Tracy Gary uh, and uh, one of the other ladies uh, we did. Uh, and I answered the many questions about the lift. So you can certainly see that. Uh, so a lift is not done. And then uh, this is where I have consistently shown that I can do the surgery without the need for the drains to the point where a year ago in May, I presented a thousand cases of explants that I have done to the world largest Congress. We actually broke the Guinness Book of World Records of the maximum number of plastic surgeons in a room and maximum number of different different nationalities. This was a conference in May in Dubai uh, where I presented my thousand explants. And I will tell you, it was a lot of friction there, as you can imagine. And I presented the fact that I can do these surgeries in a very safe, defin defined way without the need for drains. Even in the 1200 cc implant that I removed or the 1140 cc implant I removed two months ago and in the many, many ruptured implants that I have done simply because the care and precision is done in order to remove the entire implant, capsule, all inflamed tissue completely, definitively in that avascular plane. And when it is done in that manner, there is less blood loss. So in 99.7% of the patients, if not more, the blood loss is less than five cc's on each side. The avascular plane, which is the bloodless plane, which is where I dissect, I leave no capsular burden behind. I remove the inflamed tissue. I dissect in a manner where the blood loss is essentially minimal, less trauma to the tissues, healthy, good, viable tissue remaining behind which ultimately means preservation of aesthetics. The aesthetics of the patient is preserved, less pain, and ultimately a happier patient. And as you will see, this attests to the fact that two-thirds of my patients do not take much of pain meds maybe after one or two days. And so this is very important for the patients to note where when the surgery is done. I tell the many times I get questioned as to why I don't use drains. I tell the burdens on all those surgeons who use drains 100% of the time or vast majority of the times, 99% of the times, where when you put the drain, number one, the drain in itself induces seroma or liquid or irritation formation will, will induce some fluid to be formed. If a capsule is left behind, that in itself will propagate and cause some fluid buildup. If the silicone ruptures into the chest, then the drains absolutely become mandatory because there is so much caustic slash irritable tissue that's left behind and silicone that's left behind that's going to irritate the skin and cause a fluid buildup that now mandates placement of a drain. Now, the drain itself is... I have myself have placed drains in those patients where as soon as I made incision, there was free floating silicone because there was an extra capsular rupture. So in that 81 year old patient that had a car accident a month ago, she was worked up by the trauma surgeon and she had free floating silicone in the chest. So she absolutely needed not one, but two drains. There was another patient that came and she had pain. And as soon as I made incision, there's free floating silicone. Automatically, the patient gets the drain, the drain because there is free floating silicone from the trauma that she had. So this is where now the whole goal of the surgery is what? That even if the patient has a ruptured implant and all surgeons must assume that the implant is ruptured till proven otherwise, even if there is a negative MRI, to go in and remove the entire implant capsule as one system such that if there is a rupture, none of it leaks. Because the moment it leaks into the periphery, the damage is done. And now the drain becomes mandatory and all of that inflamed tissue must be removed. We know of that a patient almost three months ago from the Midwest. She went to her surgeon. She had, drain, she had an implant done from 2015. And she went to her plastic surgeon uh, in the Midwest and she had her explant done under local, under local. That means she, she was talking just like you and I are talking and listening right now. And lo and behold, as soon as the surgeon makes the cut, there is 
literally is ruptured silicon. Then the following day she posted that there was silicon coming out of her chest. The, the day after, so 48 hours later, her surgeon takes her directly to the OR, and this time under anesthesia in an attempt to remove the implant uh, residual silicone, plus an attempt to make and remove that capsule to no success. And then two weeks later, literally two weeks later on that Tuesday, uh, she then came to me. I removed the entire residual capsule plus all of that area on the left side where that implant had leaked to the point where I felt comfortable that I did not have to put a drain in. And this is the level of delicate surgery that needs to be done such that there is no inflammatory burden left behind. And she overall uh, has done relatively very well. Now, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and read some questions so I can answer. Uh, so, uh, So I'm just reading the questions in the comment section. So most of the patients that come to me, I'll tell you just like any surgery, they are certainly nervous, but I'll tell you a lot of patients are very excited about the surgery. They have done their homework. They actually know that their good health awaits them and they're uh, very much uh, 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 mentally and uh, physically ready for their surgery. Uh, So the question becomes, you know, this is what was echoed by the Australian plastic surgeon. And, you know, I just want to say, do you want to wait for a rupture and then do the explant? Or do you want to take care of the problem before it becomes a problem? So I always say, take care of a small fire versus a big fire, less trauma, less problems, less uh, fire to contain, if you will. Write to the FDA. Please write to the FDA. Reach the director. Please go to my Facebook page and write to the FDA. Let them know how you have been hurt, how your uh, they have all this data. The way they compile the data is very inefficient, as you will see. Uh, it is not optimal. It is too much bureaucracy and red tape. Uh, So I'm just reading. Uh, do your homework. So I took care of a lady two weeks ago. She saw me in 2020. Then she went through the COVID phase and then uh, she had uh, some other commitments. She also all had a child. And then she finally came to me and she said she wished she had done this sooner. But again, this was a process for her. And you know, this is where once you get the information, you know, I just want to disclose, I have zero financial disclosures. I have zero commitments. I have zero commitments to Facebook groups. Believe it or not, I have been asked many times um, uh, to basically uh, 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 advertise with many other Facebook groups and I've declined because my practice is as organic as organic can get. It is patient driven. This Facebook was a page was made by a patient um, and God bless her. She's the mastermind behind this uh, uh, series and networks of uh, pages. My office staff, my office manager, uh, every day uh, my team uh, basically goes through the so many questions. Uh, you know, again, we I have zero interest in all of this except to help my patients and I'm blessed and privileged. Uh, to have a practice that is truly 100% genuine and I have no interest financially I, I sarcastically say I'll be better off uh, putting in implants and I'll tell you uh, you know this is where you follow where your heart is especially early on in the medical career when you are uh, the poor medical student who's not intending and now has to make the decision about what to do and I'm blessed that uh, my conscience guided me appropriately. Um, so, uh, let me go ahead and, uh, what I'm going to do here is, um, so one of the other very important questions are, are, so, uh, the implant 
is basically majority of the times placed below the muscle. And because the muscle is involved, the recovery time is dependent on how much muscle is involved. Now, I will tell you, there is a surgeon that went through the belly button and did the surgery, non-board certified. I'll tell you, he makes my life difficult because it was not done right to begin with. Another patient that had the muscle that was cut in a way where the implant literally displays downward and outward, uh, the recovery time is muscle dependent and vast majority of those patients where the implant is below the muscle. My best case scenario is the patient who is past 50, who has a small implant. It is encapsulated with grade four contracture or grade three contracture, and it is above the muscle. And it allows for me to dissect the small implant above the muscle in a avascular plane without having to dissect directly on top of the rib. It is indeed what is an involved operation. I thank my team, my nursing staff, my first assist, my surgical tech, and certainly my CRNA, who are basically very much involved from the beginning and to the end as far as the team approach effort, who literally dedicate their whole uh, process into ensuring that the patient has the best anesthesia, the best pre-op and post-op uh, you know, care so that we dedicate, and again, this is only six or seven patients uh, per week. So the sutures that are used are the dissolvable sutures, which is the vicral suture and the very premium, you can Google this, is just the quill or the monoderm suture, M-O-N-O-D-E-R-M, which is kind of like a barbed wire. As you suture through, it locks. And there are four layers of all dissolvable suture that take around almost 120 days to dissolve. So the other question that I get asked a lot is, why do I not do a lift? So number one, if you look at the anatomy of the chest and the breast area, you have the nipple areola, you have the breast tissue, then you have the muscle, then you have the implant in the vast majority of the cases where the implant is below the muscle, and then you have the ribs. So when the dissection is done on top of the rib underneath the muscle, I am always in that compartment, if you will, below the pectoralis muscle, that is the P2 level below. And the P P1 level, if you will, is above, which is where the native breast tissue is. And I do not want to touch that. That's why I'm able to operate on the many patients that I've operated on who are active nursing moms, because that is, quote, another compartment, another section above the muscle. So I make the horizontal cut right in the crease and I remove the excess skin almost always, which is that tissue expander aspect of the skin that has been displaced downward and outward, such that it really adds to the aesthetics. I put some internal sutures that kind of lift and vector up the breast tissue pseudo upward. Now, in the many patients, they have recoil of the skin. Now, this is a very important point. We know this from the burn surgery. If I take skin full thickness from the thigh, let's say a burn patient, and this is a very important point. I don't think I've mentioned this before. And I take my dermatome and I remove of, or I physically cut out full thickness skin from the thigh. And I, for example, someone who needs full thickness skin graft for the face. This is when we get a full thickness uh, skin graft. If the segment of skin that I harvest is five centimeters by 10 centimeters, let's say 10 centimeters in length. When I take that 10 centimeter skin on someone 25 year old, for example, that 10 centimeter length of that skin that was harvested from the thigh will actually become six centimeters, meaning it's going to contract by 40%, meaning 60% of the skin is going to essentially remain behind, which means it's going to shrink by that much. So if you have a young lady, 25, 35, even 45, depending on, remember, the qualities of the skin, Asian skin is the best from my experience. You know, look at how many Asian, uh, the oriental skin, for example, it retracts. You don't see the effects of aging. The skin that is out in the sun a lot is bad skin. Skin of 
people who drink alcohol is bad skin, sorry to be blunt, uh, meaning the alcohol harms the skin tone. Patients who have ethnic skin because of their genetics, some people have good skin and some people have bad skin. Some people age because of uh, their cortisol slash stress levels. So people who work nights primarily, they don't get their quote beauty sleep, if you will. Their skin tone because of the cortisol and the stress levels slash uh, pre-diabetics, uh, people who are taking steroids chronically, if you will, their skin tone is different. And the point here is you have skin once removed, that certainly helps with aesthetics. The skin recoils on its own to an extent. The 75-year-old, the skin is not going to retract as much as the 35-year-old. And so you take that, the breast tissue after menopause, the estrogen progesterone effect is gone. And so the breast tissue starts atrophying, which means decaying. And so the young lady, the need for the lift is certainly not there because it's going to recoil by 30, 40%. And the breast tissue certainly, and the internal sutures help with the excess skin removed. And that 10, 15, 20% workout adds some volume to the chest and no need for that unnecessary cut around the nipple areola and down, which is in itself very wrong if you ask me. Now, if someone were to get a lift, let's say, and she has no implants, that in itself is a three-hour operation where you have the lollipop anchor lift. Now, there are many different types of lift. The true effective lift, even when done well, lasts 10, 15 years. You don't want to, number one, do an operation that, number one, the patient may not need. Number two, uh, operation that may lead to skin and necrosis. Uh, where I saw a patient once, she had really great for contracture, thinned out skin. And if you cut around the nipple areola, chances are that the blood supply to that might be affected negatively. And simply because of the amount of ptosis she had, the distance from the sternal notch to the nipple areola might be more than 25 centimeters. And that increases the chance for complications, especially when the explant surgery is being done. Number three, you have, so going back to the point where the skin retracts, the breast tissue retracts, that the a surgery that may not be uh, required. Number four, a surgery that in itself takes three hours on its own. It's done at the surface of the skin. The explant is done at the basement level, if you will, of the, the, the chest, uh, which is the rib level. Uh, and the vast majority of the times when it is below. And... This is where the longer you're on the OR table, the higher the risk for infection uh, blood clots, uh, along with the risks of putting a scar right in the center of the chest, plus you have nipple sensation loss, you have inability to breastfeed if that does occur in patients who have had lifts. And as you will see, the complications are many. Um, especially on a day when the whole focus four hours should be complete, sincere, faithful removal of the implant plus the capsule plus all inflamed tissue, preferably in the end block. And as you will see, the majority of the patients, from my experience, 80% of them are very pleasantly surprised that they do not need that unnecessary lift, period. Case closed. I love to operate. I would love to do a lift on everyone, but a surgery that's not required is not warranted and no additional risks unnecessarily. If you want to, and this was one of the questions earlier, you can get one lift a year later when everything has settled, when the inflammation has subsided. Yeah, so I see a question, uh, what do you do, what do you think about a lift on a 60 year old with numerous implants? So numerous implants means every time you go in there's scar tissue just from the surgery alone. So the, the more you go into the area, the more scarring you can get. So those patients that have had multiple abdominal surgeries, for example, you'll see every time you go in, you get more scarring, right? Same thing uh, within the chest breast area, you have more scarring, more fat necrosis, more irregularities, more nodularities that form, more scar tissue from the times that the surgeon goes in and sutures closes the incision. Now, on top of this, you have contracture. Contracture means that everything is hard and solidified and there is increased inflammation majority of the times because of the contracture. And not only that, you have an 800cc implant. That means a huge implant. That means there's a deflated skin. And now I will tell you, if you do a lift, I will tell you, you are now setting yourself up for a potential infection. 
Now, this is where you get the explant done right. You get this contracture addressed. You do the explant in the perfect manner possible. Hopefully you are not ruptured. And then once this is done, the excess skin is removed. And then let's say a year out, if you're not happy, then you may choose to, if you certainly do decide to get a lift at that time. Please, uh, uh, this, uh, a lift is not an easy operation. Uh, the older you are and the longer you are on the operating room table, the higher the chance for a clot as well. So uh, the now going back to the point. So today, today, I took care of a patient, nice patient that I operated on a few years ago. She had what was a, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, describe as best as I can. And hopefully, uh, I will be able to share this uh, with you definitively. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show this as the best of my ability. I just happened to grab an envelope here. So this is a uh, patient that I'm going to draw. Let's see who is 20 years of age and she has a nipple areola and this is the inframammary ligament. This is tight adherent to the fourth or fifth rib. So this patient, when she is 80 years old, for example, you'll see she has the nipple pointing down. This is grade three ptosis by definition in medical literature, but this ligament is still very much on. And so you see the aesthetic contour of the breast is preserved. Now, my patient today that I operate on, the second patient, she had a relatively speaking large implant and what her surgeon did was cut this ligament in order to put a large implant. So this was cut and for her, hopefully this makes sense, you have the implant sitting here underneath the muscle and this is where the ligament was cut. Now when I remove this implant, as you can see, when I remove this implant, she then gets, what is this? Excess skin that is hanging down because her surgeon cut this from the wall. Now, when I mark my patients, I mark them right in the natural crease, just like I did the left side on this patient, which is very nice and nice aesthetic contour. So today what I did was I went and removed this skin and move this up and move this down such that it would balance and essentially be like this in her, a young lady. So this, this tissue was removed and now she's back to where she was and no need for the ligament because there is no implant pushing it down, if that makes sense. This is where your inframammary crease ligament was violated. So there's a lot of coat intervention done by the previous surgeon that comes into play, especially when someone has 750 cc implant. Now, all of a sudden, that fold is much lower. And now when the implant is removed, the incision is relatively lower than compared to her natural crease. And so this is where you have these quote after effects of what was a technical problem in the first surgery. So other patients that come to me have a tuberous breast deformity. Some patients have had radiation. Some patients have had alloderm reconstruction. So last week I took care of a patient from Florida, very nice lady. She had what is the Galaflex. Gala, G-A-L-A-F-L-E-X. This is a synthetic mesh that is used. Actually, let me show it to you on my, on my other phone. Galaflex. Uh, this is Galaflex. So this is where, as you will see, this is the Galaflex. This is the mesh that is put. It degrades over time. And it is a mesh that is like this. You see it at the plastic surgery meetings. And it basically works as an internal bra, if you will. So it prevents the bottoming out. This is synthetic. It dissolves, supposedly. It dissolves 
over the next 12 months to 18 months. And essentially, as it's rough, as you saw, it allows for the body to incorporate and form scar tissue. And as it disintegrates over time, over the next 18 months, a couple of years, it leaves behind scar tissue that then works as a scaffold. So that I removed in the patient. Now there was no frank galliflex remaining because it was well over two years ago, but there was quote a lot of quote redundant fatty irregular tissue that was where the galliflex was. So I removed that because I don't want to leave that scar tissue behind because it's abnormal. It's thickened compared to the normal tissue that you would find. And again, the point here is that it is not only the implant plus the capsule, but also that irregular tissue that needs to be removed such that there is no inflammatory burden left behind. So there is stratus. A lot of surgeons use alloderm, which is cadaveric skin used in reconstruction, uh, especially in those many patients who have uh, breast cancer because uh, it is very expensive and it is primarily reserved for those patients where the insurance will cover the cost and they actually have a contracted rate. So as you can see, this is the alloderm. It's obviously a very significant amount at the lower part, but they put it at the lower part. Uh, as you can see, this is a better picture uh, at the lower part. And I'll show you a uh, another uh, patient where uh, it works as an internal sling, if you will, that prevents that implant from bottoming out, especially if these are heavy. So this is alloderm. Now, alloderm does not disintegrate. It gets incorporated and it needs to be removed as much as the capsule because in it flow these, quote, silicon leaching toxicities that we know of what is uh, the breast implant illness into the periphery. And so it is important to remove the alloderm as much as it is important to remove the capsule plus the inflamed tissue plus the implant as one system. So uh, any other questions uh, that you may have? Uh, so whenever I do the surgery, it is important to ask questions. If you listen to my pictures and videos, the patients actually feel very comfortable. They really don't have any questions. And this is again part of the informed consent. Um, there are many patients that come to me. I promise you uh, that the, the patients themselves are so well read. If I give them a marker and a board, they can give a lecture on breast implant illness. Um, so, um, so this is a good question about what is dual plane. Uh, and if you Google this, and let me show you as I read, because it's very good to show. There is the subglandular, that's the one in the middle, subglandular uh, positioning that is below the gland. This one is submuscular. This one is submuscular, which is below the muscle. You can see the red muscle. And then if you go in over here, it's dual plane, which means it's partially below the muscle and partially below the breast. And as you can see, the muscle has been cut uh, in order to accommodate the implant. And guess what? Over time, the implant just gravitates and bottoms out. So this was... Uh, popularized by Dr. Tibbetts, um, and you can certainly read up on it. This is what is called the dual plane. Um, so it's under the pec and under the breast, kind of. This is also very nice. And I'll leave it here for a second. Dual plane. Uh, let me go ahead and ask. Um, One more question, uh, let me see.
I see all my patients and I remember each one of them. Uh, uh, yes, so do you take off the extra skin at the time of the explant? Yes, so I actually mark the patients in pre-op and I mark the area uh, where you have the excess skin and I measure the distance from the nipple areola down to the crease on the right and also on the left because this is my chance to make the right symmetric to the left. And I also measure how much of the implant has bottomed out and I remove the excess skin in well vast majority of the patients. Um, so I did a case yesterday where I did not because she was a young lady, her skin was going to recoil and she had residual capsules and just looking at her exam, there was no indication for removing the excess skin. And this is the excess skin. As you can imagine, the implant essentially works uh, for uh, as a tissue expander because it's gravitating downward. So the next question is a very good question. Um, I have this very nice comment by, uh, you know, I won't mention her name uh, from Florida. Um, you know, a GI nurse. Uh, thank you very much. Good to see your remark. Um, very nice lady. Um, uh, if I do remember correctly, you were one of the, one of the stars in one of the very popular uh shows in the 80s uh so um uh, uh now going back to um 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 uh, the question do i remove the 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 fascia as you can imagine the implant sits very nicely and tightly directly on top of the rib so when i do remove i remove the fascia of the pectoralis minor because that's the capsule is tightly adherent I remove the periosteum perichondrium so you can actually see some of that has been removed and then I also remove the fascia of the serratus anterior and the inferior aspect of the pectoralis minor fascia in order to completely remove the capsule because the capsule and that fascia essentially uh, are one system, if you will. And in order to ensure complete removal of that capsule, that fascia has to be respectively removed. Now, I've been asked this many times, oh, is this not dangerous? I say absolutely not. So I took care of a lady that came from Germany a few uh, weeks ago, three weeks ago, and she actually had rib harvested to reconstruct her nose in the remote past. So it's very not uncommon and it's actually a very nice quote body part to use to do a rhinoplasty where the surgeons actually harvest, even in kids, for example, who know, who need nose nose reconstruction. I remember when I was a, in training, there was a, a young teenager who was getting a rib harvested uh, in order to use that as a strut for the nose reconstruction rather than cadaveric uh, cartilage graft for example or bone graft so going back to the point it is very safe and healthy uh, to remove the fascia and essentially that ensures and entails that that entire capsule is removed because remember that's the whole purpose of the surgery and I'll end with this thought the purpose of this is to remove the whole capsule the purpose of the explant is to remove all of the inflammatory burden that is in the periphery of this capsule as well, where you have that fatty tissue that's inflamed or irregular and hardened, and to minus the body of all this tissue that looks abnormal, palpates abnormal, and the gut instinct says it's not good and healthy, you remove it because you don't want to err on the side of not removing it. And this is where you can say you have the peace of mind that you have removed everything bad and you have had it tested. And it is very safe to remove this. And the patients do find when someone gets a facelift or someone gets like this rib harvesting, which is relatively aggressive if you ask me, but still done routinely on a daily basis. By I would say millions of plastic surgeons over the years who have harvested ribs. So it is very safe and effective to remove the top layer so that the entire capsule is definitively removed and no capsular burden is left behind and the patient has the best chance of recovery. 
to a normal state of good health minus the toxins that are within the capsule, that are within the tissue and the periphery of the capsule that are directly related to what is the gel bleed. Uh, almost a couple years ago, I took saline implants from my patient intact and I sent them to Dr. Henry Dykman in the Netherlands. And I told him, please take the saline implant from, please take the saline from the saline implant. So within, and he took that 500 cc's and he centrifuged at 11,000 RPM for one hour. And then he collected at the bottom what was a sediment of particles. And he showed by electron microscopy that was indeed silicon particles that had leached out into the saline from the silicone shell of the saline implant. And if it's going into the saline, conversely, it's certainly going into the outside and then going in. And this is why Dr. Atul Mehta from the Cleveland Clinic, he published another article along with the pathologist from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center at Dallas, where he did a biopsy of one of his patients and that clearly showed by electron microscopy and energy dispersive x-rays that this was indeed what was silica within the lung. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go to my Facebook page. And I'm going to go ahead and show that to you right now. So this is... Dr. Atul Mehta, The Proof, Facebook Live. I did this with him back in August, several years ago. This was in 2020. And uh, I want you to go ahead and let's go ahead and look at this. And I'm going to show this. And this is, again, this is not like a small community hospital in the middle of nowhere. This is the Cleveland Clinic and the UT Southwestern Medical Center putting out what is a quality paper um, where they show so chronic pulmonary silicon embolism related to saline breast implants. So that means chronic over three months. Pulmonary means lung. Silicone that has embolism means that's traveled within the bloodstream to as a result of the breast implants. And so he has shown, this is a CT scan, CT scan that shows, quote, Lung window showing bilateral peripheral ground glass opacities more pronounced in the upper lobes. Mark asymmetry of the breast implants with the right implant being substantially smaller. And this is consistent with silica. And guess what? This is his histology. This is out of the University of New York Buffalo. Uh, path as well. So the three collaborated, Cleveland Clinic, UT Southwestern, and uh, the labs in Buffalo, New York. And this is what he says, silicon embolus in surgical lung biopsy. Now these are like hard facts. There's no denying the fact. Uh, clear vacuole containing tiny refractile microdroplets is present adjacent to an alveolar septal capillary. So Dr. Atul Mehta, the lab in Buffalo and Dr. Henry Dykman through electron microscopy. This is like as clear as clear can get. You're looking at it, i.e. the silicon particles. And then energy dispersive x-rays. That was another way that we affirmed that this was indeed silica that was leaching. And that is the problem of that silicon toxicity. And this is why this, quote, poison, lack of a better word, and certainly the right word, is spreading and causing the toxicity that we know of that I read uh, in this journal. So in conclusion, I just want to make sure that all what I said tonight are not my words. I just read this off. 
I showed you the case reports. I discussed with you most importantly what the patients are saying because they're not making this up. I have no aspect. They're going out of their way, living their busy lives, financially committing to what is a very expensive surgery and a six week proximate recovery period. And uh, obviously uh, uh, the process of going through another surgery happily so that they can get their lives back. And, you know, there are many, many articles as well uh, that basically highlight to us the many detrimental effects of implants. And as you dwell into and see more of my YouTube videos and listen to the patients, most importantly, you will only realize that this momentum cannot be stopped. This is where if I was the Society of Plastic Surgeons, be it in the US or European or international, or the medical community, the rheumatologists who understand breast implant illness relatively well because this is their area of expertise with the rheumatological joint problems. And essentially, even the average person who has no concept of medicine can truly understand and grasp what and how the implants are only causing this destruction in a manner that they do that continues to evade the many people who unfortunately continue to say it is a myth and it certainly is not a myth. What I talked about today is not a myth, it's reality. And with all the professionalism, we need to recognize and we need to raise awareness so that no one should have to suffer, no grandmother, no mother, no lady should have had to suffer, no husband should have to suffer so that we make this world a better place. This is Dr. Khan, Executive Plastic Surgery. Thank you.